This video is going to be a film study look at Alex Anzalone, a guy who kind of got, I guess, overlooked uh, during the offseason with all the excitement, attention, and, and notoriety that was given to so many of the Lions' defensive upgrades, probably a lot of which I was co-signing or trying to drive the bus on. There's two underrated inside linebackers, I think, on this team, Derek Barnes and Alex Anzalone. Both of them have been around since 2021 in terms of being in the organization. Anzalone, of course, started his career with the Saints. The overall talent level of the defense, athleticism, drastically improved, obviously. I wanted to get something done on Anzalone before training camp uh, began. Things get stacked up in terms of projects, so be it. But simply put, I have to admit up front, I've, I've become a really big fan of Anzalone's game. Barnes, too. But Anzalone, because I had first saw him play in 2021 when the Ravens were about to go to Detroit in Week 3. I think he had 10 or 12 tackles against the Packers in Week 2. I kind of watched a lot of that gameplay, and, and I remember leading up to the game, I was not impressed with Detroit's defense at all. Overall, I remember actually saying on a live stream that I thought the Ravens could score 40 and the game could be over by the end of the third quarter. The Lions' defense made me look fool foolish, obviously, totally flipped the script. Ravens were very fortunate to get out of there with a win. Miraculous fourth down completion by Lamar, and then even more mir miraculous, I think, 66-yard field goal by Justin Tucker. Uh, the Lions' defense made my, my preview and my thoughts look ridiculous, and Anzalone was a big part of it. I think he had five or six tackles. Only one sack, another quarterback hit, but he, but he was all over the place. He just played like, I guess there's really only one way to say it, he played like his hair was on fire. Finally, by mid to late season 2022, when I had started to watch the Lions more intently, which really began with their Thanksgiving Day loss to, to the Bills, I realized how off base I was in my initial evaluation of Anzalone. Now, some people would say, well, well he got better, he improved. I think that's that's a part of it. Don't don't get me wrong, but there's a reason why Dan Campbell brought him over from New Orleans with him. The guy can play. He's a he's a blur when he's got a read. When there's some kind of key that he's got that does a particular thing that indicates a particular play, he's gone. He's out of there. There's no hesitation. He's extremely good against the pass into the boundary. I think that's a strength of his. When he's in man coverage on a running back, I think he's one of the best in the league. At that particular skill, he's got great timing on challenging the catch. Definitely really high awareness on the routes that those running backs are going to run from the various alignments into the boundary. He's responsible for, he's also responsible, I think, for making some of the calls or checks on the defense. I'm really not worried about the green dot. Guys who make calls or checks when they recognize something, it doesn't matter whether they have a green dot on or not, regardless of who's wearing that on their helmet. Anzalone is one of those guys. I think 2023 also showed he was a little underutilized previously as a blitzer. He did have 120 plus tackles for the second consecutive year, including three sacks to go with 12 quarterback hits. So all told, three seasons in Detroit, Anzalone's got 330 plus tackles, 211 solo, 19 PDs to go along with 21 quarterback hits. In 2024, the dynamic is crazy for Detroit on defense because there's upgrades all over the place to the guys that he played next to in 2021. Drastically different team. Terrion Arnold, Ennis Ray Straw Jr., Davis, Robertson, all talent upgrades in the secondary. Not, e not even to mention Brian Branch, Jack Campbell, and then, oh, by the way, the best out of all of them, Aiden Hutchinson. We're going to get this started by talking about Anzalone's pass coverage. It's, it's what I'd like to focus on the most because I think it's really legit. I was blessed enough in 2023 to watch two really talented pass coverage guys as far as will linebackers. When I say will linebackers, I mean guys who play into the boundary when the ball is on a hash. I'm talking about Alex Anzalone and Patrick Queen. Both of them were tasked with covering running backs often into the boundary in man coverage. Okay, occasionally lining up and, and playing a tight end in a man situation, but more often than not, a running back. This is a third and three against the Falcons. Could it be blocked, quote-unquote, a little bit better by the outside receiver? Of course. Basically, we're talking about a pick or a rub concept. Drake London is running a route, though, not concerned with necessarily picking the inside linebacker. That's Algier, who's a load. I saw him play against the Ravens the year before, 2022. He's a difficult guy to tackle. 
and Alex Anzalone consistently puts himself in good position to make tackles as soon as the ball was caught, or in the case of this brilliant play on a second and short against Tampa Bay, get a pass deflection to pre- prevent a catch in the first place. It's kind of a, a cool look by the Lions defensively into the boundary. They've got two linebackers and Kirby Joseph blitzing off the edge. Anzalone does a great job with his pre-snap, pre-snap alignment in almost every case. When you're playing inside a linebacker, you're normally slower than the tailbacks or running backs that you're often assigned to guard. So if you're looking at the running back right now, who's got his right foot just inside the hash, so presumably his, his left foot is spaced out a little bit like that, check out Anzalone's inside foot, the one that's closest to us, closest to the bottom of the screen. He's basically got his foot perfectly aligned just outside of or stacked on top of the top side foot of the running back. He's given himself enough room to be able to keep up with the faster running back to the field. A little play action, and Anzalone knows where his help is, which is to his left, the bottom side of the screen, and where his help is not to the top side of the screen. He has none up to that side, and he has a lot of room, a lot of grass to cover. He's able to get up there and get it. I thought this game against Tampa Bay was a brilliant example of his ability in pass coverage and all the different things that they ask him to do. Man on the running back, zone into the boundary. We'll get to the last two plays in this segment. I'll show you what I think Anzalone's versatility allows the Lions to do, excuse me, allowed the Lions to do last year that could be even more multiple in 2024 with the talent upgrades they have in the secondary. Empty set by the Bucks. Could the ball be thrown better by Baker Mayfield here? Yes, absolutely. Anzalone nonetheless is in good position. Gets another pass deflected with his left hand on the inside against Palmer, who I think gave them trouble that day in a couple of situations. One more here against the Bucks. This is a third down again, third and nine. Anzalone is in man against the running back to the boundary. Ends up being beat by the running back because he's not taken as as safe of an angle. So what I mean by safe of an angle is if you press here, which he does a little bit downhill, then you leave, you make your job more difficult to flip your hips, turn, and get this way if and when the running back takes it vertical. He has the speed to make up for this in many cases. Anzalone is a much better athlete than people give him credit for, and I think that helps him in coverage because he can do things like this, cut the angle a little bit too much if you ask me, on a third and nine, we would say the first down marker's back here. So we're defending that. We're not defending the the running back until he's close to the marker. I mean, we're defending him the whole time, but we're not overly committing to a shorter route. I gave you the all 22 of this one so you could see him downhill. Here's the end zone angle, which doesn't necessarily illustrate it as well. What it does show, however, is that even on a play when he's beat, when the running back is by him, Anzalone is still able to recover. He's got really high-level awareness of the routes that are run and which running backs, which tight ends, which receivers are going to show their hands in a particular way when the ball has almost arrived. Pass defense here, week four against the the Packers in the first game. The win in Green Bay ends up being an interception by Jerry Jacobs, who's since departed. Also a huge hit on Christian Watson uh, by Tracy Walker. But we'll let you see it one more time here from the end zone angle. I know most people prefer end zone angle film. you got a play action concept, so everyone's working to the left. Quarterback, running back, presumably could mesh somewhere at that T. Offensive line also working in this direction. Anzalone is great. He's got really fluid hips, if you ask me, and great feet. Able to change directions multiple times and adjust to the ball. Puts his plant foot, right foot, in the ground and is able to burst out of there. And then now his left foot is his plant foot to able to bring it back to our left, his right. Get the pass deflected. Maybe it's not a great throw by Jordan Love or great recognition, but it's certainly a great play to get his hands on the ball by Alex Anzalone. What what does he allow you to do as a Lions defensive staff? He allows you to be really versatile because he can play man on running backs and tight ends, occasionally a slot wide receiver if he's supported deep. I am really interested in your 
opinions on this. The ball was on the left hash. Anzalone is to the field. His eyes, to me, appear to be directly on the running back. Jalen Reeves Maben is actually going to pick up the running back post-snap. There is certainly a mix-up. This is a fourth and six. It's a mix-up by the safeties, Joseph Branch, and then C.J. Gardner-Johnson, who's getting a mouthful from Aaron Glenn post-snap. It's another one of those shield releases that the Rams use so often to get Cooper Cup open. I don't mean it in as, as disrespectful, disrespectful a fashion as it may sound, but he is afforded a lot of pick, rub, and shield concepts to help him get open. We're focusing on Anzalone here. I believe his eyes are on the running back either as a decoy or him and Jalen reeves Maben are tandem reading the running back, meaning if the running back was to release out to the flats, perhaps Anzalone would go be responsible for him. If the running back releases to the opposite side, to the boundary, reeves Maben would go with him and Anzalone would look to find work somewhere. Kyron Williams does neither. He's not necessarily moving on the snap. reeves Maben commits to him. And then watch Anzalone, the awareness of I don't think that Kirby Joseph and Brian Branch blew this coverage necessarily. I think Joseph is reacting to Matthew Stafford's first look, wherever his face mask is looking. He's breaking in that direction, even though it's away from him. Anzalone's awareness or his ability to do this and make it look like it could be man on Kyron Williams and then change or adapt into man on a tight end post-snap, depending on how the routes work out, I think is quite exceptional for an inside linebacker. Were that a safety who would execute something like that, I don't think we would be as impressed. Finally, in pass coverage, allows you to hide coverages. Allows Aaron Glenn to show one look. In this case, you've got Cam Sutton, your outside corner, who's obviously gone from the organization at this point. Looks like he's in man on Puka Nakua. Brian Branch, a nickel safety, looks like he's in man on Cooper Cup. And then Anzalone stacked on top of a third receiver. I think this is 10 personnel at this point. Maybe that's a tight end. It is not manned by either one of those guys. It is essentially a cover two concept. Stafford has to work down to the running back. Kendall Vildor makes a tackle to get what was a critical stop, if you ask me, holding him to a field goal. One more time to let you see a little bit of the obfuscation. These guys are dropping out of here into zone coverage. And Cam Sutton is dropping into the middle of the field where you would not normally expect an outside corner to cover in a cover two zone defense. It's a great job by all of these guys involved. Look at the similarity in depth and then alignment. Kendall Vildor is a little bit more shallow because he was trying to jam the number one receiver inside down there. It's a great illustration, if you ask me, of how versatile not just Anzalone is, but Brian Branch. Cam Sutton as well, at least on this play. Anzalone's a big part of it, if you ask me. It's okay with me if you don't think that he did anything consequential on this play, trying to illustrate to you the versatility that he provides in terms of his pre-snap alignment and then what he can do post-snap off of it. For being a guy who sure does rely on his speed and his athleticism against the pass, there is no lack of physicality or aggression and and the requisite technique that's required. Now, we're going to start this off with an option play against the Falcons early in the season, go full circle later on. I do think the Lions kind of get themselves in trouble at times when the defensive end, edge player, outside linebacker, whatever, is so strongly going to take the dive back a give read for the quarterback, if you will. It got him in trouble against some of the more athletic guys during the season. But what it leads to is the inside linebacker to the side, in this case Anzalone, executes a gap exchange. Hutchinson steps down, take away the dive. Anzalone ends up exchanging or folding over the top. That's hence, this, hence the name gap exchange. It gets them in trouble a little bit. I'll explain that with the last cut, last play from this cut-up or this list. What I love about Anzalone on this play is the line of scrimmage is at the 43. It's an option concept. The fullback with a full head of steam 
is looping around Aiden Hutchinson. He's reading Hutchinson just like the quarterback is. So it's a dual read, and he smacks Anzalone in the mouth. About one yard past the line of scrimmage, Anzalone nonetheless is able to recover. He's not dislodged. He's not decleated or knocked down, obviously, and then make the tackle on Desmond Ritter, who's a pretty good athlete, for a two-yard gain. I feel like that play right there, along with some of the other ones I'll show you here, gives you a great picture or an idea of how versatile he is against the run as well. Wild card home game against the Rams. Tackle for loss against Kyron Williams, super talented running back in his own right. Anzalone getting pushed over by Malafonwu for whatever reason. And he's really good at finding the gap to go through, but also fitting it where the running back fits. People say shoot gaps as an inside linebacker. You don't just shoot gaps. You, you read what the running back is reading, and you try to see where he's going at the same time. It's a skill. That's why these guys practice it every day. That's why they work on their fits so often. Anzalone's a guy who doesn't shoot gaps needlessly. He finds the gap that the running back is taking. He tempos the running back appropriately depending on the scheme, whether it's downhill flow, angle flow, or outside flow. I will give you the end zone angle of this one, but what I want you to notice is as everyone is moving in this direction, watch Anzalone fit off the back side of this, and then when you get the end zone angle of the same play, you'll see the relationship that he maintains with the running back in terms of being off the back hip. Hutchinson is going for the boot. Obviously, looks like a potential cutback lane here for Rashad White, another really talented running back that the Lions had to deal with. Anzalone fits it perfectly. There's other guys there, Jack Campbell and some DBs. I think Anzalone is an incredibly underrated guy across the league. If I was to cover the Rams or the Raiders or the Seahawks, I could probably say that about two or three guys on their team as well. I happen to cover the Ravens and the Lions to the best of my ability. I think Alex Anzalone is about as good as it gets in terms of a guy who covers at a really high level across multiple schemes and is really good against the run no matter what the flow is, meaning downhill, angle flow, or something wide. Whatever your phrases or terminology is to use to teach linebackers, he's good at all three or four of them. And it makes me kind of reflect and take pause now when I look at players for the first time. Because again, when I looked at him in 2021, prior to the Ravens visiting Detroit in week three, I did not think really highly of him. Early in the game against the 49ers in the NFC Championship game, excellent job against the run for the most part. You do have this unusual alignment with the defensive tackles for the Lions being set back off the line of scrimmage whereas the nose tackle is literally right up on the ball. See, te different teams do that for different reasons, but Anzalone is triggered downhill now. And then watch the fit that he gets. You'll see it in a moment from the end zone angle off of the fullback's path. It's basically a designed windback off the zone. So the offensive line is zoning everything to our right, the right-hand side of our screen. And then the fullback, 44, who used to be a Raven, is going to kind of start out on the same path as McCaffrey, and then he's going to bring this back abruptly. They're using his athleticism, his change of direction skills. The only difference is, or the only problem is, Anzalone can change direction with the best of them as well. Tried to pause it at this exact moment so you can see he's got a great angle view. For an instant, though, that window closes fast, and he fills it. We used to say to our linebackers, think like a thief. If it's an open window... Go through it. You don't want to go through a closed window and make a whole lot of noise if you're trying to rob somebody. Back against the Falcons earlier in the season, it is a five-yard gain for Rashad White. Anzalone is to the field, so he's not always to the boundary, don't get me wrong. I think sometimes you as a fan or maybe opposing teams can kind of glean what coverage it might be depending on where Anzalone is, field or boundary, if it's an obvious passing down. Watch how he redirects here off of Campbell's fit. Campbell almost shows this a little too early here. Offensive line is able to pick it up, maybe because they knew it was coming, maybe not. In any case, Campbell on the same stunt, offensive line picks it up. 
White cuts it off of that, and so Anzalone is able to overlap. Basically, those guys think of the gap exchange concept that I gave you earlier. It's the same concept. They're basically allowed to play on the wrong side, fold over the top, because Campbell blitzed and, and essentially wrong-armed it. Similar concept in terms of the run play that I showed you a little bit while ago. A little while ago. This one does go down as a four-yard gain, except now the fullback is on full flow. So instead of kind of J in this back, he's going downhill now, and Anzalone is the backside inside linebacker. Perfect technique here, staying on the backside hip of McCaffrey, meeting him in the hole. Lines are also bringing C.J. Garner-Johnson off the edge for the boot. So these guys can all... Full commit and go. Anzalone is the guy who's looking for potentially the counter or the cutback with C.J. Gardner-Johnson being responsible for the possible boot by Brock Purdy. Very multiple player. Most of these guys at the NFL level that start and play every damn snap, they're, they're versatile. They're multiple, right? But Anzalone, I think, takes it to a different level. The physicality here, the recognition, the use of his hands, I think is exquisite. Now, you do have a four- or five-yard gain by the running back. I don't think it's due to um, Anzalone. I think the backside nickel defender kind of overflows this. I think it's Will Harris. I think he's going to kind of overflow this to the top side of our screen, the, the right-hand side of the defense. But watch Anzalone read this. I think he's cross-key in the H-back tight end right now. You can almost kind of see him. And then as soon as the tight end is gone, Anzalone's gone as well. And they're gap exchanging it again. The D end is stepping down and wrong arming it, clogging that hole up. And then Anzalone's folding over the top. I think that's Cade Otten that he's bullying there for a moment. And then he has the athleticism to, to double back against the green when a running back cuts downhill. I think Harris is the guy who kind of overflows it here. No one for that gap when Rashad White brings it back. Anzalone is the guy who makes the tackle there as well. He played a brilliant game against the Bucks in Week 6. I was super impressed. Everything isn't perfect for him. Don't get me wrong. I always like to provide some balance here. He's going underneath, and there is no one to support him. Now, granted, he's not the guy who's, who's losing in terms of his gap initially off the snap, but he does, I think, uh, go on the wrong leverage side of this. Basically, you got a C-gap player in your D-end, an A-gap player in your nose tackle, Anzalone responsible for, in my opinion, B-gap. Too easy letting this combo work out. Basically, the defensive tackle ends up losing his gap, so you got a two-way go as far as Anzalone. You've got a, a new gap created in here, and then the gap to 66 is left, or left on the screen, Anzalone's right. I think Anzalone chooses wrong because the unblocked guy is the backside inside linebacker. Can't get there if you go underneath. Anzalone's not perfect. He's presented with a number of different techniques and situations throughout the course of each game and an, an overall season. One of the rare miscues that I saw, I didn't think he played well. I didn't think he played to his standard in Week 18 against the Vikings. I'm not sure if he was injured that week or what, but there was multiple instances where I didn't think he played uh, to the standard that I now have for him. Finally, last play against the run, another option situation. You can see the running back is to the left of the quarterback, our right on the screen. He's going to cross Justin Fields' face. This is the read man, Josh Pascal. Watch what he does on the snap when he's left unblocked. He steps down violently to take the running back, force a, give, excuse me, force a keep read by the quarterback. Fine, no problem. I would say that there needs to be times where you kind of either half-man this as the defensive end, meaning step down and play the latter half of the running back after it's given or play the inside half of the quarterback after it's kept. Basically, it would be muddying or graying the read for the quarterback as opposed to such a distinct, abrupt movement by the DN, which now forces, and if teams know you're going to do this, then they can just inside release their tackle, and now it gives Anzalone something to deal with. He does get credit for this tackle. Still goes down as a seven-yard game for Justin Fields. I think the scheme needs to evolve at times against some of these athletic quarterbacks um, in the option run game.
Finally, I mentioned earlier that I thought he was underutilized as a blitzer prior to 2023. Let me rephrase that. I now recognize or realize that he was underutilized because he has showed so much potential in doing so in, in 2023. Now, two of his sacks were against the Raiders, who fired their head coach, I think, one or two days later. Point being, Anzalone has filmed that he's put out of him being disruptive as a blitzer or as a secondary contain guy. Secondary contain is not, means it's not a design of the play for you to be a blitzer immediately. You have to recognize the need and then do so on the fly. Anzalone here against the Chargers. This is going to be Kirby Joseph's interception, in case you don't know. Brilliant read by him. Great eyes to be able to see that the ball is not handed off. And then going ahead and redirect. Not sure how he knows to do this, but you can see if he does not, there is a huge amount of space between two Chargers players. As it stands, Anzalone gets pressure and a quarterback hit. Joseph's make, Joseph makes a brilliant interception along the right sideline for us, left sideline for the Lions defense. This is as perfect an example of secondary contain as you can give. And it's not a one-time thing. Week one against the Chiefs, Anzalone to the boundary, his customary alignment, 11 personnel play action. Anzalone's dropped in coverage, but his recognition doesn't just isn't just high-level pre-snap and then immediately after the snap. It's also during the play. I think he adjusts really well, and he's got the speed to make things happen. Secondary contain after Mahomes escapes, able to get a quarterback hit. This was a big play, if you ask me. If you can show Mahomes and, and show your, your teammates, hey, even when an athlete like Mahomes escapes the pocket, breaks contain, basically, is the coaching phrase, we're going to be able to get to him because I'm fast enough as an inside linebacker to be able to burst and make that play. Pacheco's being covered well by Barnes. He's got eyes on the quarterback for a moment. Great burst, closing speed, commitment, and no fear of a penalty or anything like that. Finally, third and 10, week eight. You can see Anzalone is stacked as a Mike linebacker. And in fact, he's going to be involved in the coverage element first. Jimmy G, who's since gone as well, Decides to scramble, and Anzalone leaves Hunter Renfro, and then totally committed. No hesitation, no pulling up at all. That's the thing I, I noticed about Anzalone, along with the athletic gifts, the recognition. He's totally committed to every technique or every situation that he's put in on the defense. For him to be a holdover from the 2021 defense, along with Derek Barnes, and I believe a couple of other guys, Aline McNeil, Anzarike, and there's one other player who I'm missing. A shout out to the guys in my Discord for letting me know exactly who all was still remaining from that. For Anzalone to be the lone remaining full-time starter, along with Barnes, who I'd consider a starter, even though he may not start every single game, I think it says a lot about Anzalone, and you have to give credit to Dan Campbell, because Anzalone had on-again, off-again years in New Orleans, meaning his rookie year, not much impact. His second year played well. Third year, not much impact again. And then fourth year, fourth and final year, that is, in New Orleans, he was able to have, I think, 71 tackles, moves over to Detroit in 2021, and at this point, to have 330 tackles through three seasons. You're talking about a really high-level inside linebacker who, if I, don't, I have no idea about Madden ratings or anything like that, I'm not blessed enough to have a system to play that, those games at this point, I wish, I suspect that he would be an 85 to 88 plus in everything, meaning against the run, against the pass, pass as a blitzing slash secondary contain linebacker, I would have to rate him 85 or above as well. As a, quote, edge rusher blitzer, well, no, that would not be how you would adjudge Alex Anzalone. With all of the attention that's going to be given to the talent upgrades on the defense, Alex Anzalone was someone that got lost in my off-season film study videos, that's why I showed so much film, even though we're obviously into the 2024 season now. I will be doing a reaction video to the Lions Week 1 preseason game. I have considered live streaming during that game. I don't do so for Ravens games. I don't live stream during Ravens games because I don't want to step on the feet of two other 
content creators who I really look up to look up to for the Ravens who rely on that revenue and I, I suspect so I choose not to do so for the Ravens it is available to me as a as a Lions content creator as well unless you're aware of someone who does something uh, of a live stream of, of a live stream type of video that I you wouldn't want me to see me interrupt uh, their flow or or their fan base but appreciate you guys time let me know what you think of that thought for the first preseason game and perhaps the second one if you enjoyed the video and you think other Lions fans would appreciate this film study look at Alex Anzalone with some projection and commentary about 2024, then please consider grabbing a link to this video and sharing it out on social media so other Lions fans can enjoy it as well.